Good morning, everyone. Please get seated so we can start the day. So good morning. My name is Smriti Patel. I'm the director of Global Mentoring Initiative based here in Geneva and one of the large Indian di diaspora <laughs> from around the world. Um, and we work uh, a lot with the international aid system, uh, but also with local and national organizations around how we can support them more and better um, and ensuring that uh, they're able to respond to their own crisis. So there's been a, a kind of a long, I would say, vocation. <laughs> and it started with um, my involvement in the tsunami evaluation uh, in 2006, where I was um, in seven countries. And what I saw there really convinced me, because we were looking at the impact of international response on local capacities. I spoke to thousands of people from seven countries, and it really opened my eyes in the way we're working. We need to do it differently and better. And in a way, that started my journey and real passion for accountability to affected populations and locally-led response. So that's why I'm here, <laughs> very passionate about this subject, and really looking forward to, to this day. So what are we going to do today? Really, we are looking at um, what are some of the you know, global uh, diaspora that w and what are they doing in terms of their involvement. Um, so DMAC is a really a global initiative aiming at enhancing the mutual knowledge and coordination and communication and coherence between diaspora humanitarian actors and the institutional humanitarian actors. So really trying to bring these two together. And really the purpose of today is to really provide the space, and we already started it a bit earlier, right? For relevant actors to come together to exchange and you know, development, uh, exchange on the developments that are happening in the sector connect the community working on and in diaspora to the humanitarian aid system and provide a platform to engage and build ties with each other. So I hope they already started in your introductions in the, in the earlier session. Um, so just going through the day, uh, we will be first um, just having welcome uh, and I'm going to uh, be um, uh, welcoming um, Andreas from DRC uh, uh, on stage, and then really looking at uh, what are the, some of the key things, and we will have keynote speeches to, uh, to highlight some of the key things that are happening. Then there will be panel discussions, um, really looking at trust and, um, and other issues in the sector, and really a conversation between the panelists and myself. And we will have a, a group session, a, a photograph at 12.15, going for lunch. So again, you will have some uh, opportunity to, to meet with each other and, um, and exchange information. And after lunch, we will be looking at other panels. And I think some of you have already put your names on the panels, um, uh, going to the different sessions. And there'll be a discussion there, more deepening some of the discussions in terms of topics on funding and other issues. Um, and after coffee, we'll be going to looking at what research has been carried out so far, what were some of the findings, and what is the way forward, and it's really important forward-looking, right? We may have done things in the past, but how do we move forward? Um, and so we finish with a dinner at uh, Banle Paki, and uh, we will give you information on that uh, later on. I just wanted to go through some... Um, housekeeping rules with your remarks. Uh, we are going to have a videographer uh, for external communication, and I think when you filled in your application, your registration, you were asked if we can have permission. So if you really do not want to be videoed, you need to um, contact the staff, DMAC staff, and DMAC staff have a blue, you know, we all have white labels, they have the blue 
tags, right? So contact them if you're not comfortable, let them know. And there will be photographers um, in the different sessions taking photographs. Um, ask questions, any practical things in terms of, um, you know, organization name, you know, anything that you need, need for them. But what we want is really respectful and constructive conversation. You may get differences, because we always get differences when we have different people in the room, but we want to make sure that, you know, we are really think forward thinking. Uh, if you have phones, please can you make sure they're on silent mode. Um, and um, if you have any issues during the, the day, please you can contact the, the DMAC staff. So, um, what I wanted to do is uh, to invite um, Christian Gard from, uh, from the, who is the global head of emergencies in DRC, the Danish Refugee Council. Um, and in his function, he covers emergency policies, procedures, and a related preparedness and response framework, as well as being the lead on the assessment, formulation, and startup of the new emergency and country corporate operations. He's been working in the sector for more than 30 years, so really brings rich experiences. Uh, has worked for UN, NGOs, um, and others, so really brings that perspective, but has been working for DRC for the last 15 years. Uh, really focused on building organizations' emergency preparedness and response capacity. And I'd like to welcome him to uh, come and address us and uh, welcome the participants. Thank you, Chris. Christian. Thank you. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to be with you for the day. On behalf of the Danish Refugee Council and as a member of DEMAC's Strategic Advisory Group. On behalf of all, I warmly welcome you to this joint venture between diaspora, institutional humanitarian actors, researchers, donor representatives, who all work together towards the one thing we are all spending our time, energy and passion to achieve a better uh, humanitarian response that can help more people in need. Over the past years, DEMAC has worked tirelessly to create dialogue between diaspora actors and institutional humanitarian actors and to enhance the visibility of diaspora actors in the humanitarian ecosystem. DEMAC has brought expertise and experience within the fields of humanitarian aid, diaspora engagement, and dialogue between actors to the table. DEMAC is funded by the USAID, and today's event is the concluding activity of the work the initiative has been engaged in over the past two years. I've also had the pleasure to stand on DEMAC's strategic advisory board for these two years. My fellow board members, as well as members of DEMAC's technical reference group, are in the audience, and you'll get to know them throughout the day. Since 2015, the Danish Refugee Council has hosted the DEMAC Initiative and has thus been working to support, facilitate, and enhance diaspora actors of development and humanitarian aid. In our world today, the humanitarian system is under strain, with levels of forced displacement rising and driving an increased need for emergency funding. The bleak picture of growing needs has less led to an increasing recognition that time has come to rethink the humanitarian architecture. We need a more inclusive humanitarian system and alternative actors such as diaspora need to be part of that system. Recent humanitarian emergencies such as the ones in Afghanistan and Ukraine have brought this into even starker perspective. To that end, the work of DEMAC could not be more timely together with representatives from across the world, including Somali, Pakistani, Ukrainian, Afghan, Timorese, Tunisian, and Myanmar diaspora organizations, DEMAC has been exploring spaces for increased collaboration between inst the institutional humanitarian system 
and diaspora organizations in humanitarian assistance. DIMAC knows that when it comes to working with diaspora, it is not a question of inviting new actors to the scene because the diaspora are already there, operating as multisectoral, transnational, fast responding actors. They have a connection with an understanding of their country of origin or heritage, which plays a vital role in humanitarian assistance. In hard to reach places where access might be an issue, diaspora organizations have a unique advantage due to their local um, connections and ties. They can additionally respond to the growing demands for remote management and cross-border response in countries where international actors have a limited presence. And to advocate on behalf of crisis-affected populations in the policy arenas of their countries and regions of residence. Yet despite this, diaspora organizations are not always fully acknowledged as a key actor that is part of the collective humanitarian response. And often, diaspora organizations operate outside of the institutional humanitarian system, which is where DEMAC's role comes into play. DEMAC's work has been a key actor behind stronger representation and visibility of diaspora organizations in the humanitarian ecosystem. DEMAC has been bringing together operational and policy level actors from the diaspora and the formal humanitarian system to discuss challenges and opportunities of our ways of working, to learn from our differences and identify commonalities. It is also great to see that DEMAC is now expanding its scope of work by incorporating operational response mechanisms, which are now being piloted in the humanitarian response in Ukraine, and, where, and we will hear more about that in the afternoon session. We have invited you here today to explore and discuss that work with us and with each other. And are thrilled to see so many of you joining us here. We hope this event will provide a space to share DEMAC's findings and learnings with you and to listen and gain knowledge from your experiences, which will, more importantly, help to continue shaping the future engagement with DEMAC. Part of DEMAC's work is raising awareness of the great work diaspora organizations do. And one tool the team has recently been working on, with the support of many of you in the audience, is a good practice guide and videos. We're now going to show you one of them, focusing on the successful organizational development of a Pakistani diaspora organization. I'm looking forward to engaging discussions with many of you throughout the day, hearing and learning from your experience in humanitarian response, and hope you will enjoy the conversations. Last, I would like to thank the DEMAC project team for their commitment and dedicated efforts these last two years. Thank you. I have a very close and strong connection to the Swat Valley um, because uh, I've grown up there and for five generations uh, my family have been leaders and rulers of the Swat Valley and they've invested a lot in the people and the communities of the Swat Valley. We started out with initially just relief for the people, which was done under crisis. But once the, that crisis was over, we realized that we had an opportunity to bring long-term improvement in the lives of the communities over there. It's important to grow the organization because the more you grow, the more people you can impact and we want to impact the maximum amount of people and not leave anyone behind.
to be uh, a viable organization long term, uh, you have to uh, really uh, create trust in the community. Once the community becomes strong, you literally create thousands of volunteers to help with your program. When you show people uh, that you're honest and 100% of your funds are going to the programs, it spreads by word of mouth. I also go for like three to four months to check on everything. Uh, sometimes some of our other board members also come along with me. And this is something that created trust amongst the people that are donors. Our belief is that we want to make a long-term change, a long-term impact, and we want to empower communities to work for themselves. Great. So really great and impressive to see the, you know, the, the work of the diaspora around the world. And um, being one of the diasporas in, of Indian community, I know when we had the Gujarat earthquake, how it felt to me and how my family responded as well. So it really uh, you know, resonates in terms of that feeling to be able to help your own people. So now I'd like to uh, invite a keynote speaker who can you know, set the scene for us um, and uh, the way we will um, perhaps address some of the key issues in this uh, conference. And so I want to welcome Paddy Sangaya um, Kudinson, and she's the migration um, governance expert and vice president and Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. Um, she's a Zambian national with over 17 years of professional experience as a development economist uh, and migration governance expert. Her work covers migration governance, diaspora engagement, development cooperation, and regional integration. Her experience includes supporting NGOs, governments, regional economic communities, as well as UN agencies in um, uh, formulation, implementation, as well as monitoring uh, and evaluation. She's taken on roles with the European Commission, the UN agencies, as well as consultancy firm um, as program manager and coordinator, uh, coordinator and a consultant. So bringing in lots of experience. Uh, Paddy, please welcome. We would love you to share with us some of your perspectives. Good morning. It feels a bit Im intimidating to be up on a stage. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, the opportunities for us to engage in a much more uh, sort of uh, different kind of setting. So just, you know, all protocols observed. Really glad to be here in person to meet uh, faces that you see, we've been seeing on screens for the last couple of years and coming back to the space where we're able to engage. Um, I had written a long statement this morning in trying to reflect on what we're going to talk about today um, and in trying to think what actually should a keynote speech be like on this. Um, and I'm always brought back to the space of how intentional can I be, how authentic can I be. And I think that in a lot of times we just need to humanize what we do. So I thought that you know, I, I looked again at the uh, conference objectives that we have, and, and for me, three key verbs stood out. So I think my teacher of English would be very proud of me for, you know, spotting out uh, action verbs. So exchange, connect, and engage. And I kept on thinking about these words. And for me, again, then looking at this audience with a diverse range of actors, from institutional players to diaspora members, but also thinking about that whole body of support that's that elevates and helps, and then everyone is centered around crisis, centered around a humanitarian setting. 
and then of course the local actors. So that whole ecosystem um, for me then helps me to humanize um, a lot of what I, I, I would talk about today. So let's have a go at it. So in the introduction, um, I was given as a person who has worked around diaspora engagement. And when we had a, a chat uh, with Alexandra and everyone else, I always say that I stumbled into diaspora engagement because I was a member of the diaspora. I didn't actually know there was something called diaspora engagement. I think we were just meeting with embassies, meeting with members of diaspora, acting with the homelands, without sort of thinking there had to be a structure or something to be done, because it's, what, it's a way of life. So I think that's important to always look at it as a way of life. And that way of life then extends out to you when there's crisis, when there's a need, whether, it, whether it's at home or it's about your people in another territory. So I stumbled into this space and work, and as a Zambian, um, I find myself in this transnational space, which is much bigger, so being a member not just of the Zambian diaspora, but being a member of the African diaspora, whether it was in China or Tanzania or Malaysia, and now where I live in Kosovo. But then there were other identities, um, and I will explain in a minute why all this is important. I think these other identities, as a woman, as a professional, as a mother, uh, the religious background, the interests that you have, but also as a cultural ambassador, all these become very important in whether you're engaging with embassies, engaging with members of your own diaspora, engaging with professionals on the space, but also when crisis comes in, all these identities again speak. And I thought that's kind of an important thing, and, and I think a lot of times we forget this diversity, not just in the member of the diaspora, but then in the bigger body. So coming into this, uh, what sounds like a posture called the Vice President of the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism, which is a very active board that I'm very proud of because it opened up that space of trying to see how different diaspora organizations then would work around different work, whether it's development or crisis. And I'll come to crisis in a bit. So all these things are very important. All these things then break down for me the theme that we have for this conference, which is enhancing coordination in, hum in a humanitarian setting. And I thought, why should we really ex explore them? I thought, let's kick off with exchange. Now, when we talk about exchanging, we need to identify who we're we exchanging with. We need to identify the diversities that people bring with. And in a, in a space where there's a, there's a crisis, in a space where there's an emergency that has to be dealt with, we're using all range of skills. And we have seen the diaspora bring out all these identities. We have seen the diaspora bring out all their skills. It doesn't matter how they're formalized. It doesn't matter whether they are recognized politically at home or even in the spacing where they sit. And in fact, it doesn't matter what their regular status would even be in, in most cases. So that for me then speaks to this body of diaspora that sometimes we want to give an identity. Uh, in China, they call them overseas Chinese. Where I come from, we say diaspora, and I think if everybody speaks in their own language, we have very different words of what we want to give the diaspora. But this diaspora also has different generations operating. I always like to give an example of my sister, 10 years younger than me, that has a very different relationship to the homeland. My diaspora, my diaspora engagement strategy, or my engagement with the homeland, has a lot to do with the connection with my mother. Her diaspora strategy has a lot to do with results and impact. And that then talks to us about how we need to see not just this body that's moving along and supporting the homelands, but that also has a lot of dynamism in it that's looking for results and that's looking for impact. And that remains very important. So not just the skills and the resources that we bring along for the purpose of the humanitarian needs, but also the dynamism that we're looking at in terms of the results that we want to see. So the new diaspora questions but it also questions the old diaspora. How are we helping? How are, do, how are we engaging? And then for me, it brings in the space of the local actors and how we engage with them. Are we as diaspora engaging in the way we think we want to engage, or are we listening indeed to the needs? So that has a lot to do, I think, also in terms of how diaspora picks information. How do we pass on information that's used in the design even when we're engaging in a humanitarian crisis, which is at a very short space of time, or when we've been engaging for a long space, for we, when we have a longer space of engagement. It also made me think, when we think about exchange, about a, a network of diaspora that I'm on. When the Ukraine crisis, um, you know, when we heard about the Ukraine crisis, a lot of us in the diaspora are not living in Ukraine, 
a lot of us in the diaspora, so Zambian and African diaspora, not really knowing what to do and thinking evacuations would be organized by governments, needs would be supported by governments. But what we also realize is that there was an invisibility on third country nationals that were in Ukraine. And in a very small, but in a very impactful way, a group of diaspora organizations become to morph together. Today, they don't even have a name but very much active on the ground, supporting not just African nationals, but supporting a whole range of third country nationals that still remained quite invisible throughout from temporary protection schemes that have been announced by governments on the European ground and how that has moved to the national level, but even in further away lands. So then it talks about how diaspora is important in its smallness in it, and how it big it is, individual experiences, organizational experiences and requiring all of us to have our hands on deck in supporting, giving support to students and third country nationals who are sitting in bunkers and not knowing and not having access to governments who didn't know what to do, to supporting students in understanding and navigating their space on frontline countries and beyond. So that work of diaspora for me then humanizes the whole needs. But at the same time, I can look back to the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic or I can look back to cyclones that happened in Zimbabwe and Zambia at some point, in which even governments wouldn't know how to get the data out. How do you move people? How do you understand where people are? Because the data systems don't really work sometimes also in the homelands. And di diaspora coming in to connect that need for that qualitative information that is then passed on to organizations on the ground, but also working with government. So then it speaks to me also about diaspora as connectors. They join the dots. Diaspora diaspora connect the dots also in financing, in bridging the knowledge and the gaps that are needed in crisis, in helping those who are willing to finance, so bringing in philanthropy, in pulling efforts across the transnational spaces, so not just looking at nationals in a particular space, but also looking at that full movement of people. But it also talks to us about connecting with governments too. And there, of course, we know that we still remain with a lot of challenges, as there are some diaspora would have left home because of that disconnection with that same government they are looking to connect to in times of crisis. So I think there are some very important things we can learn there. There are also some soft and hard issues. From our experience in Ukraine as a small network, we have seen there are softer issues. Okay, migrants don't have access to their documents. That's relatively simple for consular protection. Migrants in, det in detention, that's very hard. Irregular migrants in detention, probably almost invisible. But diaspora continue, in the end, making phone calls, linking up with advocacy, linking up with civil society, maybe even taking it a step up to international bodies to make sure that um, the voices of those migrants are heard. So that's